Welcome to Getting Real with Josh Boyer, the show that embraces radical vulnerability and authenticity. Authenticity. Josh creates a judgment-free zone for his guests to share openly and candidly. Candidly. Listen in as they discuss life, philosophy, passion, drive, empowerment, and purpose. Join us as we seek to leave our world better than we found it and send ripples of positive, lasting change out into the world. All right, you're good. I'm here with Matt Scholard out in, uh, I did, how, do you, how do you pronounce the city here? Man, this is Washougal, Washington. Washougal, Washington. Greater Portland area. Yeah, it's actually... Uh, See a beautiful spot, man. Driving up here, I was like, man, this is great. Yeah, it's great. You just caught it at the wrong time, man. You should have brought some of that sunshine with you. Yeah, it's about, I think it's going to be 95 today in LA. Yeah, I think so. it's going to be 65 here in July, so <laughs> unseasonable weather. Normally, I live here because normally the summer months are just absolute paradise. Like, we endure like six months of dreary, cold, misty, nasty blanket cold, and then like in the summer, it's just magical. But man, they're really testing my patience this year. Yeah, I have a buddy that, um, lives in uh, Medical Lake, mm. and uh, I don't know if you know where that is, up in um, eastern Washington, mm-hmm. and so he wants me to move up here, and I'm like, you know what, like, I totally would, I'm just, I, I'm worried about, like, the winters, you know, just because with my back, I'm like, ah, I don't know how I would feel. Yeah, they're pretty brutal, Yeah, I'd be and usually the summers are when you earn it, but man, this is not a good selling point for you coming up here, but yeah. glad you're here, man. Yeah, for sure, brother. I um, So, I want you to share your backstory, if you will. Um, with a guest, you know, like your upbringing, where you grew up, what that was like, joining the military. I think it's pretty cool that we were both in the Air Force. Um, I wasn't definitely not as a, a cool guy like you doing PJs. I <laughs> actually, you know, funny story, when I went through boot camp, I went through, um, I got in in December of 2000, so it was before 9-11, and they had like this PJ guys come in the room and they were giving us this like interview or giving us like a presentation and they were like, yeah, calling all, all these names. And my name wasn't called. So I thought it was something personal. I was like, dude, did I fuck up? Like, why are they call my name? <laughs> Come on, guys. I want the invite. Yeah, for sure. But the thing is, is uh, I guess when you go in guaranteed uh, security forces, like it's a critically manned career field. So you're kind of like disqualified from even attempting to go to NDOC. Hmm. I didn't know that. And I think if I would have pressed the issue a little bit, maybe they would have given me the opportunity. But at any rate. Um, seeing what you guys go through and, and watching because we're on the same base, you know, watching some of the training and stuff. It's intense stuff. I think it takes a special person to be able to not only have the balls to go to the training, but to get through it. Because um, isn't it, it's the longest pipeline, isn't it, in the Special Forces? Uh, yeah, it's the, I mean, it's like a two year plus program for, for most guys. Right. Um, but as far as, you know, if you're comparing it to other services, Special Forces, like we get more specialized training up front that uh you know if you were going to be, go be a green beret like you know you either get jump or you either get free fall you either get dive we get both you know so it's like uh you just when you compare it to other services pipelines like yeah it's it's definitely the longest yeah but um you know it's the most um you know you're the jack of all trades master of none so there's a lot of information a lot of skills that you have to learn in that period of time so yeah why did you uh choose pjs <laughs> over uh combat control well, uh, great question, actually, if you want to jump into the whole backstory piece. Yeah. Um, so I was, I was born in the U.S. Uh, I was actually born in, in Philadelphia. Um, I think my parents, at the time, both my parents were in the Navy. And my dad got out and became a helicopter engineer for Sikorsky. They make, uh, yeah. they, they make all Blackhawks. And um, so he was a helicopter engineer for Sikorsky. And then pretty early on, back in... I think 84, he, uh, he took his first overseas assignment and we packed up and moved to Sicily. Um, as, uh, attached to the, to the Navy base, but my dad was a civilian, you know, was a, uh, as a civilian engineer. Um, and he got this taste for overseas travel, man. And, and we, were, we were moving like every 18 months, you know, 15 to 18 months moving all around. So I grew up overseas, you know, Middle East. I lived in Bahrain, you know, Korea, multiple times in Australia, um, and I was always sort of associated, like by proxy with with if there was a U.S. military presence. But I wasn't there as like a military uh, a military de- dependent. So right. um, actually, when we lived in in Bahrain, it was completely uh, completely separate. My dad worked for the Crown Prince, 
Um, we just lived on the, you know, on the, <laughs> on, on the streets of Bahrain. It's quite, quite, quite lavishly, actually. Right. Um, but uh, so I, I, I grew up kind of exposed to all these different cultures and, you know, these different ways of life and traveled frequently and basically stayed overseas until, uh, until I was 17. Um, so I, I, I graduated high school in Australia in 1998 and um, moved to, I, I, I had to leave, you know, I had to leave Australia and go do something. So I moved to, to New Jersey to go live with my grandmother, um, which was ridiculous. So I've been basically overseas my entire life, you know, all these yeah. different countries, went to 18 different schools. Um, you know, I consider myself kind of like cultured and traveled and then I, I moved to Atlantic City, New Jersey. <laughs> so it was like, all right, man, something, uh, something has to change here. Jersey Shore. <laughs> Dude, it was, uh, it was pretty ridiculous. Um, OG, I ask you, man, if, if, sorry to interrupt you, but if, if you could do it all over, like if you could do it differently, if like with your kids or whatever, yeah. do you think it was better that you were cultured and went to all these different places? Or do you think you would rather be the kid that grew up in the same city with the same kids from kindergarten all the way through high school? I'll tell you what, man, this is something like when I was a kid, I longed for it, right? Like I longed for friends that, that I had roots with. I longed to be that, that guy who was like, oh, my uncles coming over today. I'm going to go stay at my grandparents' house. Like yeah. I was geographically separated by thousands of miles from my extended family um, and never really had that experience. So as a child, I craved it. I very much wanted that, that stability. I wanted those roots. I wanted to grow up and know the same people. I wanted to be like, you know, I would go to school with kids who are like, oh, I've known that guy since, you know, third grade. And it's like, well, that's cool, man. I've known you for like three months now. So to answer your question, as a child, I, I very much craved that and I very much wanted it. And then as I got older, um, and you know, after during my, my, my time in the military, and then especially after the military, when I started to you know travel professionally and like expose myself again to all these different cultures, like I really valued the experiences that came from it. You know, you can you know you, you mentioned earlier when we were chatting this morning about um, you know you can go anywhere and like meet new people, and that's sort of like you could literally drop me in any country, any place in the world, and I'm gonna find commonality with somebody. Yeah. Um, you know, and connect as uh, connect on like a deeper human level versus just like connecting on a matter of convenience or a matter of like, well, I mean, I've known you forever. Like that's, you know, we went, we, dude, bro, remember me from like first grade? It's like, <laughs> so when I, when I travel now and like when I, when I interact with people, I feel like I can go just like a little bit deeper and, and connect with them in a way that maybe they don't connect with the people that they, um, you know, that they, they spend time with or they they grew up or with whatever. So to answer your question, both, right? Young, mm -hmm. wish I had it. Now, man, thankful for the experience. But for my kids, it was important for me to offer some sense of stability. You know, it was important right. for me to like have a base of operations where they could experience that, um, that th those roots and, and that stability, but then also expose them to travel, expose them to different things and, you know, different cultures and take them places and, um, you know, show them the world at large but also have a place that they can return to that you know, totally. you know and know people so that's funny because i had the same thing where i was moving around as a kid and uh it was from cities like i was pretty much the most part i was in california and then went to texas for a little bit and then came back to california and i remember hearing the kids you know like oh you remember in second grade third grade whatever and it's like no i don't because i wasn't here because i wasn't here man <laughs> right? but uh you're so right on the the tip of like there are certain guys that you've known or girls that you've known like your whole life and that's pretty much your only connection for sure um is the fact that like you've known each other oh we've known each other forever so that that's that's it but you're not really connecting you know yeah. it's not really like a, a deeper connection so i've found that over the the course of like me doing this podcast and meeting new people i've met more friends that I feel more connected to than some of the people I knew my entire life. Absolutely. And especially yeah. the thing with like, you know, podcasts is you, you, you converse with people and maybe you learn more about somebody, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I've been on a few, a few different podcasts and every time I, I, I finish it, I'm always left with this experience of like, man, I should talk to everybody in this capacity. Like we should all have conversation like this, yeah. you know, um, kind of, kind of a morbid comparison, but, um, you know, especially for, you know, the veteran community, like we've, we've all lost a lot of friends along the way. And, you know, when we go to these memorials and we hear these like eulogies of, of people who we loved, who have, you know, who've fallen the way we speak about them. It's like, why can't we speak to people in that way when they're alive too? So, you know, totally. it's, a, it's a morbid comparison. I, 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 but it's one of those things where, you know, the, the concept of podcasting is like, okay, why can't we have these conversations with everybody? You know, and then especially as, you know, our, our, you know, our brothers and sisters have fallen along the way. It's like, why can't we 
tell them how we feel about them when when they're still living you know and, and connect with with everybody kind of on that deeper level so 100 yeah, percent, and, yeah. and i've learned that too from uh from other people that i podcast with that there was another guy i brought him up earlier actually before we got on the podcast joshua coburn it's one of the things he talks about is like leaving nothing unsaid yeah you know, where it's like because i asked him we were talking about the fear of like you know anxiety of flying and like whatever and i was like do you ever trip about that while well, you travels he's like never i was like why not and he's like you know what man because everybody that i love knows that I love them. Everybody that I respect knows that I respect them. I could leave this world knowing that I left nothing unsaid. Yeah, that's what it's like, about. Wow, that's powerful. That I powerful. like that. Yeah. yeah. So cool. I, I'm trying to, I'm actively like working on that to be like, you know what? The things I need to say, I'm just going to get them off my chest and say them. So like, should anything happen to me or God forbid something happen to one somebody I love or care about, at least we knew like I can go away from that knowing like, you know what? I didn't have anything I was holding in. You yeah, know, man. Let it all out. That's a practice that um, I've actually sort of inherently done for a number of years, especially when I was a PJ. Like every time I would I would go on a mission, you know, when I was deployed, or every time I do something considered dangerous, like jump out of a plane or you know do something, the last thing that I would always whisper to myself was, you know, I, was, I would tell my kids that I love them, you know, and it's like for me, you know, if uh, if something were to happen on that mission, you know, the last conscious words that I choose to say were telling my kids that I that I love them and. Um, for me, it, it, it offered some form of softness, right? It was like, okay, if I, if something were to, you know, befall me, if tragedy were to befall me on this mission or in this event, like the last words that I chose to say were of love to my kids. So totally. trying to not be so morbid about it now. And, you know, but also kind of, kind of balance that with like the, you know, the 3 a.m. drunk text of, I love you, man. You're like, this. So, <laughs> <laughs> totally. trying to find that happy medium and that happy balance. But, uh, it, it's cool to see that this, this concept of, um, of like vulnerability and sharing kind of our uh, our you know our deeper thoughts and our our um, our desire to connect with people is becoming a little bit more socially acceptable, especially in you know our, our military circles. So I'm thankful for that. Absolutely, man. Yeah, man. You and me both. So what? Um, so going from New Jersey, you were like, hey, I need to get out of here. <laughs> this isn't working for me. Um, did you know like yeah, I'm gonna go to the Air Force? Like that's you know I awesome. I didn't, man. So I grew up. You know, I grew up overseas, but the one, I, well, I didn't have this this common element of of knowing the people that I was growing up with or having my family. The one thing that I'm really thankful for that I had my entire childhood, entire childhood was I had uh, I had the ocean, I had the water, and um, you know, I started I started surfing, I started windsurfing when I was seven, and um, it just became this like lifelong love affair with with the energy in the ocean and i just i it, it consumed me it became it became all that i ever wanted to do i just wanted to be in the water i wanted to be riding a board i wanted to be surfing i wanted to be windsurfing i wanted to be free diving i wanted to just be in that environment constantly so i think i had this like this maybe like uh subconscious knowing that whatever i did whatever i chose to do was going to involve the water in some capacity and um, I, I didn't know it at the time. I was still kind of sorting myself out. You know, I just I just graduated high school in Australia. I just I'm adjusting to living in the United States. I'm sort of like figuring myself out. You know, I'm turning 18, um, and it's like like where do I go from here? And um, I think like like all of us, when when we're sort of handed that independence as an adult and as a man, it's like well, well, well you know, I have I have a lot of options in front of me, and I need to explore some of these different ones and. It, you know, I didn't, I didn't have that, that moment of epiphany and that like, oh shit, I'm going to go join the military. I'm going to go, I'm going to go do this until I had left New Jersey. I'd moved to, to Florida where my, my parents had left Australia and moved back. And I was like, yeah, I'll go, you know, hang out at my parents' house for a couple months. And, uh, I, I watched the movie, The Perfect Storm. Oh wow. <laughs> and man, it was like, Fair you know, b b besides, you know, super sexy George Clooney and Mark Wahlberg and this like really compelling story. I was like, oh shit, maybe I'll go move to Gloucester and go be a, you know, be a sword, sword fisherman. But man, there was this scene in the movie where like the boat, have you seen the movie? Yeah. Totally. Uh, dude, of course. So the boat starts to capsize and then like they're, uh, they call this, they call this guy, you know, his helicopter. And man, the way, the way, I didn't know who, I didn't know what this guy in the back of the helicopter was. All I saw was the most violent, chaotic, turbulent ocean that it just like was swallowing these boats. And then I see this helicopter and I watch this dude jump out of a helicopter and swim over and say some cheese dick, like cheesy ass line. But I was just like, yep, 
That's it. I gotta, I gotta do that. Whatever, whatever, whatever function this guy is performing, mm-hmm. I need to do that. So, you know, this is, uh, what is this, 2000? I, um, I go to, I, I thought it was a Coast Guard rescue swimmer. So I go to the Coast Guard, the Coast Guard recruiter. And um, at the time I was, I was working for British Airways and it was pretty, you know, it was pretty cool. I got to, uh, you know, to continue to do some like travel and to be exposed to these different cultures. And um, I went to the Coast Guard recruiter and so it's like, hey man, I'm working, you know, for British Airways over here, but you know, my, my whole life and I've just been in the water and like, I, I feel that there's no better person who to show up to somebody's darkest day on the ocean than me. And he's like, hey, and I told him about the perfect storm. He's like, hey man, that's really, really cool. Listen, that was not a Coast Guard rescue swimmer. I was like, what the fuck, what? He's like, he's like, that was an Air Force pararescueman. And I was like, oh shit. He's like, when we can't go, we, you know, these guys go. These guys go, they go everywhere. And, um, <laughs> which if thinking back to my, to my young brain and knowing that I was talking to a recruiter, I give that guy a lot of credit because he didn't bullshit me, right? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. you'd think he'd be like, oh yeah, my name was, yeah, I was a Coast Guard rescue swimmer. Come over here and sign a dotted line, son. <laughs> but uh, he didn't, man. And, and he directed me to, uh, to the Air Force recruiter. Dude, that's a lot of integrity right there. It was, it, absolutely. That, you never hear those stories. It's always like, the opposite. It is. <laughs> and it's funny because I, when I went to the Air Force recruiter, I can look back and be like, man, that guy just bullshitted me left and right. Holy cow. But, uh, you know, the, the Coast Guard guy definitely steered me in that direction. That, that's hey, awesome. You want to go be a PJ. And um, it, I, so I, I'm at the recruiter's office and I'm, I'm talking to him about it. And this is pre-9-11 as well, man. So, yeah. you know, there's no there's no conflict either. you know it's like he's he's describing pararescue as it was at that time oh man they're you know they support nasa and these guys are just on the cutting edge of techniques and tactics and procedures for jumping out of planes into the water and like you want the water mission he's like man like that's it. like the water is what separates pararescue men from everybody else like we're the best in the water there's nobody on the planet who's trained to rescue in the ocean like this and i was like <laughs> yeah man like take where do i sign you know so, uh, so the, 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 the real aha moment for me was when I saw that movie, The Perfect Storm, and I saw that guy jump out of the helicopter, I was like, man, that's all I want to do in life. I want to be the guy that, like, I, I've always felt this deep connection to the ocean, and no matter how bad it gets, no matter how intense the, the energy is, or like, what's going on, like, I can show up to somebody's darkest hour in the ocean <laughs> and, and, and save them. Um, how many times I actually did that mission versus, you know, all of the Afghanistan, Iraq, and, you know, all those other missions. Yeah. That's a different story. And right. that's, a, that's, you know, um, but the, the initial, what, what drove me to, uh, to become a PJ was, was the ocean, man. So that's fucking so cool. Yeah. Dude. Cause it takes a, t- uh, I think it takes a special person to number one, like, uh, there's guys that talk about it and say they want to be it, you know, but they're not, there's not. They don't, they don't really want it. They just want to say they, that they want it. You know what I mean? Like where it's like, you know, people say, hey, I want to be a Navy SEAL. It's like, do you really want to be a Navy SEAL? You're just going to do it because it feels like you had a bigger purpose. Like you had a bigger purpose of wanting to like genuinely like help people, like be there for them in their darker hour, you know? I think everybody, you know, from I've, I've met, you know, a lot of people across all the different branches of special forces and special operations. And, you know, a lot of people who've been you know honest about their you know well I, I wanted to but I quit I, you know for whatever reason I, right. I didn't make it through and I, I genuinely think that most people most you know at the time it was all men most men they they have this deep desire to succeed for whatever reason it is you know they want to they have their own everybody has their own reasons for why they want to subject themselves to become the best right it's you know, some of it has to do with uh, like our impressionable brains at those young age. You know, we're we're young men, like we're still we're still impressionable, and it's like, hey man, like you want to be the best, want to be the biggest badass, and it's like, of course, yeah, of course we do. Our hormones are just screaming, like yeah, fuck yeah, I want to be a seal, I want to be a PJ. Um, and I I think it's there when you when you talk about people who are successful and and make it through, it's not that they're like any more like no, they're not any more special than anybody. They're not better than anybody else or not worse than anybody else they're just like people who can put aside like their own discomfort and recognize their place in like something greater than themselves right. so for me it was like well yeah like i'm under the i'm underwater I'm, you know i'm freaking hypoxic i'm gonna pass out i haven't slept in a week like i'm i'm hungry i'm tired i'm cold i'm exhausted but it's like all right, man, like this, this serves a purpose, right? Like this, this isn't, this isn't personal on me. This is them. This is the instructors trying to identify 
who they can trust to go out in someone's darkest hour. And, you know, I recognize that. And I think guys, you know, I've had these conversations with a lot of my buddies, you know, SEALs and, um, you know, SF. And um, it's like there's that common denominator. They're able to put aside their own personal discomforts and, and identify with something greater than themselves. So seeing the bigger picture. Absolutely. And, and recognizing their place in that bigger picture. Right. What do you think the difference is between... Um, PJs and the rest of special operations because it's like it's almost like you hear so much about SEALs you hear so much about Green Berets you hear so much about Delta well not so much Delta but like you hear so much about all these other special operators and special operations guys that are out there doing their thing um, but very few people even know that Air Force has a special operations unit for sure you know, so you talk about Air Force like oh Chair Force haha you know you got <laughs> a bunch of pansies you know whatever yeah and not many people know about combat controllers and PJs what do you think that is is that something that they purposely do like where they don't like advertise it that much no or? I don't I don't think it's purposeful and I think it's about the change because we finally got a movie coming out man we oh finally shit. got a movie yeah it's called The Last <laughs> Full Measure it's about uh, Bill Pitsenbarger one of the uh, the first um, well, he, he received the Medal of Honor posthumously for actions in, in Vietnam. I think it's going to have like Samuel L. Jackson in it. I don't. I, oh, I, shit. Yeah, man. So it's going to be some get your Medal of Honor, motherfucker. So, <laughs> yeah, man, I, I can't wait. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. No, I, I think a lot of it has to do with, um, man, I, I fucking love taking the piss out of all my SEAL brothers, too. It's like they got they have movies and they have books and they have good hair. And, you know, shit, they had Charlie Sheen back in the 80s, man. They like, did. Fuck, dude. They I wanted, did. I'm not going to lie. I wanted to be a SEAL so bad after I saw that movie. There was, like, between between the initial opening scene where, like, they're on that op and it's like, God, talk to me, God. And it's like, God's the sniper on Overwatch. I was like, oh, fuck, that's so cool. <laughs> oh, my God. And I'm like, I'm like 10, you know. And, but, um, <laughs> so... And there's more of them, right? You know, there, there, there's more SEALs. There's more Green Berets. There's, you know, there, there's more exposure to, to these special operations than there were pararescue men. And it, I think part of the, uh, well, one, not having books and not having a lot of movies or not having any movies and very few books was that, like, we really couldn't tell people what it is that, that pararescue does. And it was such this, like, beautiful concept that it just like let's create this let's create this man who is who can rescue anybody from anywhere on the planet let's make him a paramedic let's make him you know free fall qualified combat diver let's make him a mountaineer let's do an ocean rescue he can fly in any helicopter platform oh by the way he can shoot he's a direct combatant he can you know kill you with his bare hands like all this shit and so it's like they they made these really fucking incredible guys called pararescue men and i think their application and what they're going to do was sort of like um, not utilized properly for so many years. And then, I mean, but it's, it's hard when your entire function is, is designed to rescue somebody in combat and we're not at combat, right? So, I mean, there was a, a long period of peace with, you know, relatively small, you know, not relatively small, but, you know, lesser um, full-scale operations. You know, we had PJs in, in Mogadishu. We had PJs in, in Panama. We had PJs, you know, that have supported all of these smaller scale military operations, but we just weren't in conflict. We weren't at war until September 11th happened. Right. Post September 11th, man, you got guys, um, you know, Jay Lane jumping out of doing the PJ mission, man, like literally like jumping out of a plane in Afghanistan to an unsecured drop zone you know, to go stick a double amputee with an IV and save his life, man. Like these guys were doing this shit and, you know, there, this book started to come out. There was this book called None Braver that came out, you know, um, talking about Jason Cunningham and, you know, some of the, uh, the early GWAT pararescue men that kind of paved the way for this exposure for the, a pararescue men's capability to be capitalized on. And then um, it, things really took off and, and people started to recognize what PJs were probably um, 2009, 2008, 2009, when some brilliant general somewhere was like, hey man, fucking, we have these, did you guys know we have these dudes over there who do all this shit? Oh, and they, they have like fucking helicopters and they can come rescue you anywhere. And these guys are the most like skilled trauma medics that exist. Oh, and if fucking, guess what? If, there, if there's like a technical rescue situation, like they can do that too. Oh, and if, they, if they, they can defend themselves in a firefight. So at this point, some, you know, I, some general's like, fuck yeah, I want these guys. Like, full full time like on every mission 
So then we start to get um, a more Vietnam era sort of um, skill or not skill um, employment. You know, we weren't just sitting around waiting for that pilot to punch out behind enemy lines and we we're going to go fucking Owen Wilson them and rescue him. It's like we actually had a purpose <laughs> where we were being utilized and flying out on these missions, doing technical rescue, doing extrication, doing fucking dive missions in Afghanistan and Iraq and jump missions and fixed wing and giving fucking guys blood and field amputations and pushing all these drugs and saving so many lives. You know, if you look at this, um, you know, the most volatile periods in Southern Afghanistan and the Afghan conflict, like, you know, we have guys with, you know, multiple hundreds of missions and, and generally like hundreds of saves. Um, and we were saving, you know, we weren't just, we weren't just saving SEALs. We weren't just saving special forces guys. We were saving fucking everybody. You know, we were saving Marines. We were saving Brits. We were saving, you know, guys from fucking Sweden and Finland. And we were like, our, we just words started to get out and it's like, fuck, we need these guys. Um, so then, so then, you know, the joint special operations command starts to be like, well, shit, we, let's put one of these guys with every SEAL team. Let's put one of these guys with every special forces team. Yeah. And, you know, just like, just like anything that takes time to develop traction, you're, you know, you're, we were talking about this with the podcast, like when, when you have, when you have an, a solid product and you have consistency, which is what a PJ, a PJ is, and then people start to notice. And so, um, there's more, there's more people that know of the pararescue mission now. I mean, we're never going to be as badass as SEALs, you know, even though we're, like, fucking better looking. You know, we're more fit. We have better hair. <laughs> you know, we're just generally, like, better human beings. Um, we're, just never, <laughs> we're just never going to be as, as well known as them. And, and that's fine, man, because, you know, what, what it all comes down to is that, that end user, right? Like, do, do I give a fuck if I... You know, if, if somebody knows what I do and like, is that feeding my ego or is the end result that like, hey man, I want to go bring this, this guy home so he can see his fucking kids again. So it's separating that, that level of selflessness, but balancing it with like this desire to like feed our, our ego. And I'm not gonna lie, man. Like I, I, I fucking love walking around base and like putting my beret on and Fuck you yeah, know, like that shit was cool, man. But it's like, that doesn't, that doesn't fucking mean anything. All that is, is just like. That's a hat. That the, what it represents is the most beautiful thing ever. But it's like, that shit doesn't matter. What matters is what we were doing, what the guys that are doing have done. It's like we're fucking saving people's lives and we're giving people another chance at existence. And, you know, for me, that was enough. It's like, hopefully, you know, this person, now that they have a second chance at life, they can go off and, you know, leave a lasting impact on humanity, even if it's just like seeing their fucking kids again. So... For me, that's that was what pararescue was about. It was about it was about the end user. It was about saving lives. It was about going there at somebody's darkest day, darkest moment, and fuck man, telling them a joke as I'm like you know pump, pumping them full of ketamine or you know whatever I was doing to 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 treat that patient and to take away some of their suffering. Um, so that's what it was about, man. And um, I'm, I'm I'm thankful for the experience. I'm thankful for the opportunities. It's like. You know, I have a lifetime of, of memories, a lifetime of stories, and I love to share them, but my favorite component of, of sharing them is not to just like tell the no shit there I was stories, but it's to be like, what lessons did I learn in those moments? Or maybe I didn't recognize them then, but what lessons have I extrapolated over the years that have passed that I can now use to make myself a better human or to share with somebody else so that they can maybe be a better human, so. Totally, so <clears throat> speaking on that, what was your hardest mission that you ever went on fuck man that you can remember that you can recall like the first one that comes to mind you know where you're like that was tough so there was a uh there was a <clears throat> on instagram i i posted a uh, i posted a picture with a story um of a, a particular mission in southern afghanistan i've actually um the, the picky kind of and the story kind of went viral and uh, i went on a few different podcasts and specifically spoke to that mission and while i don't necessarily subscribe that it's like my most difficult mission it's probably the one that had the most um the most manner of reflection in the aftermath but so one day uh, i went to a um uh so this is so let's let's just kind of paint the picture that this is afghanistan 2009 this is um this is under general stan mccrystal the mm -hmm. former jsoc commander and it was a big it was called Hearts and Minds, right? We were, you know, we were trying to win the hearts and minds of yeah. the of the Afghani people, which, 
man, that's fucking cool. There's a campaign of it. I try to win, you know, everybody's hearts and minds when I was in those roles, like, you know, to, to connect with people. And that's not to, you know, not to deviate on a tangent, but that was a, a one of the times or you know, every time I was deployed, I would be thankful that I had this opportunity, that I had this skill where I could connect with you cross, like cross language and cross cultural boundaries. Like, even though we didn't speak the same language, even though, you know, uh, we are fighting a war in your country, like I could still connect with you. So, right. so anyways, um, th this, this, this concept spread out to the hearts and minds campaign. So what that meant was any person, any Afghan civilian, um, who was injured or, you know, caught in the crossfire or collateral damage or, you know, um, what, whatever they could go to the coalition forces, excuse me, and we would support them. So this was a common practice of, you know, a guy would you know, fucking find an IED and blow himself up. But we, uh, we had, a, we had a, um, a group of kids, man, they were outside of their house and they were playing, or outside of their compound, they were playing and they, uh, they found a pressure plate IED and it detonated and it ripped like one of the kids in half and fucking really just traumatically injured, you know, three of these kids and, um, and we flew out there and, um, you know, these, these kids were, uh, you know, they were, they were roughly the same age as, you know, as my kids were at the time. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I had plenty of experience with, with, with kids and, and trauma and, you know, I, it, unfortunately you become not, not calloused, not crass, but it's like you, you, you learn coping mechanisms to deal with, you know, this sort of trauma in the, in those moments. So initially the trauma of, of, you know, being, called upon to to provide medical and care and you know and, and support for these injured kids was was a big deal and um so my team and i we you know we took these kids and you know we did our best man we treated them and you know it's 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 so tragic to see these kids are out playing and now they're you know one like fucking blown right in half and you know a lot of these kids just have you know traumatic amputations abdominal eviscerations their faces are all blown up and they're clinging to life and you're doing the, the best that you can and um you know so that that in itself was 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 difficult and then um so we you know we we, we did our piece we did the best we could and we we handed them off to the next level higher higher level of care and then the very next day we um we get called out to to the same the same kind of you know area the same province and what had happened was there was this guy who it turns out that uh, the, the village was really upset about the death of these of these kids you know they lost they lost a lot of their you know families have lost kids in there and word had gotten out that this this dude was the bomb maker man he was the one responsible so this guy was trying to flee town and um, he ends up hitting uh, a coalition checkpoint and he, he goes to blow through the checkpoint and they fucking lit him up and he ends up living and he's, he's, he's still alive. Oh. And uh, they search his vehicle, man, and he's got, you know, fertilizer and he's got pressure plate IDs and he's got all this shit in the back of his, uh, in the back of his shitty fucking car and uh, he's still alive. So, man, they got a call. They got to call us. We got to go, we gotta, we gotta go treat this guy. So we fly out and <clears throat> pick, this, pick this dude up. And it's like, man, you want to talk about a difficult decision. So I have this guy. He now becomes my patient yeah. for, you know, the 30, 40-minute flight to, to drop him off at the hospital. And he's uh, he's alive. He's he's conscious. You know, I think I think he took one. He took one to the, to the chest and maybe one to the head. But he was like still conscious and still uh, and still pretty lucid. But man, the day before, the other the, the the patients in my helicopter were his fucking victims, his casualties, and they were kids. They were little fucking kids, man. And they 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 didn't deserve any. I mean, they were just trying to live, you know. And like, and they're out playing. And this this fucking guy, you know granted the kids weren't his target i understand that but it's like he was responsible for that totally. so it became this um this ethical dilemma of like man i have to treat this guy i'm i'm like bound by by geneva conventions i'm i'm bound by law to to provide medical aid for this dude and uh and i did and i did the best i could man but man this this fucking guy I, I, I've, I've spoken a lot about the, about feeling hate. 
Um, and that's something that, you know, I, I, I've shared, you know, in my own different stories and my own different platforms of like never of like what it's like to actually feel hatred, to look into somebody's eyes and like you're trying to find some ounce of humanity so that you can find a, a little bit of compassion so that you can do your fucking job. And this guy's looking at you with just this pure, vile, ideological, just hatred. And, uh. And it was rough, man. Like I'm, I'm balancing on, on one shoulder. It's like, I feel like I have this, uh, you know, this, this gravity of, of the situation the day before with these kids. And it's like, I want to, I want to like, you know, avenge their deaths and their, their maimings and their traumas. And then I have this guy who I can just feel him hating me. And it's like, man, like, wouldn't it just be easier if I just, you know, fucking push you out of a helicopter. And, um, I continued to treat this guy, man. And, uh, it was, it, it, it killed me inside, not because, you know, like I wanted to, you know, I, I wanted to, to see him suffer, you know, and it yeah. was, but it's like, to me, it was, it was more about turning off that, that part of myself and like not, not allowing myself to feel that internal darkness because I, I had to separate myself from him. It's like, no, bro, I will never fucking be like you. I will never have this darkness inside of me that I can feel you have towards me, despite what I know you, what you've done and what you want to do. Like, I refuse to allow myself to, to go down that hole. So it was like, and it was, there was a lot going on. That was, that was probably for me the most emotionally and psychologically tormenting missions, um, of my career. Wow. Um, so that would have been heavy. Did he live? Uh, I don't, I don't know. I think he did when, uh, when we dropped him off at, at the hospital and we, we took him to, to a coalition base, um, because obviously, you know, he was at this point going to become a, uh, a, a prisoner for his, you know, what his, right. his contributions to. So I don't, I don't know, man. I never, I never followed up on the guy, but he was, he was conscious, man. He was lucid. I, I tried to, I tried to give him some water at one point, like he was like gesturing and I like turned his body and I like went to give him water and uh, he starts to like vomit. So I kind of position him differently and he spits fucking blood and vomit in my face. And I was like, man, this is, uh, this is too much. This is, this is mm. tricky. <laughs> oh, fuck, so I, I, I don't know if he lived. I, I, I suspect if he did, he's, uh, he's, he's an unhappy human being um, wherever, wherever he's at these days. But how do you, uh, as an operator, how did you reconcile some of that stuff? Because I feel like, you know, when I go back and relive some of the things, even in my childhood, you know, where it's like, man, that was traumatic experiences, you know, and you're reliving it and you're trying to like sort through it and process it. But as a grown man and as an adult going through something like that, seeing these kids that are the same age as your kids and then having to treat the fucking scumbag that was responsible for it. How do you reconcile that in your own head? How do you like work through that? What was the process like? You know, it's a, it's a good question, man. Um, at the time, I, we're never, we're never taught how to, how to deal with, with trauma. We're never, at, at least in those days, you know, this is, you know, 10 years ago at this point, we weren't, we weren't taught how to cope with trauma in a healthy way. We never, we, we skim the surface of these, uh, you know, the concept of like, critical incident stress debriefing which is a common practice and you know domestic emergency medicine it's like we we sort of just like skim the fucking surface and we acknowledge that while that may have been a tricky mission we probably have 10 more just like that today to go on so it's uh it it becomes more of like uh like hey bro you, you good bro yeah yeah, yeah I'm, fine. I'm good man yeah i'm fucking good man you know and then it's like you, you we you you mask it and you you run from it and you hide from it through fucking working out or you know just you you find a way in in theater in in country to like to just suppress it you push it down and then you get home and you're just fucking stoked to be home you know you're glad to be back and life is is a little less less dangerous and like you you have like a, maybe a different filter with which to view the world around you but man, those, those thoughts, they, they, they try and find a way out. You know, they, they, they always try and find a way out. Trauma is not, we're not meant as human beings to store this trauma. So it starts to find a way out. It finds a way out through irritability or, you know, we, we lose sleep. We become insomniacs. We start to have nightmares. We start to become anxious. We start to become aggressive. 
and uh, and man, what's the what's the go to in the military? What's that? That fucking class six right down the street, man. Just a sweet, yeah. you know. If the team fucking bar doesn't numb my problems, I can go to the class six and I can buy a handle with Jack Daniels for eighteen bucks, and that's gonna numb the shit out of me. Oh, fucking, that's not working. I'll go to the flight dock. I'll get a you know, get a prescription for some Ativan or some Restoril. Hey, man, I'll take Ativan and Restoril. I can't sleep if I just. I need this, bro. I I, I fucking can't sleep. You don't know, man. I, I I don't know what the problem is. So, for me, it was it was recognizing these uh, these destructive avoidance practices. You know, for me, it was alcohol. It was it was definitely abusing the uh, the benzos um, because they made me feel good and they 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 helped me sleep. They let me they let me find that that darkness. I would always wake up screaming from the darkness. I'd always come out of it, and you know, I was I was uh, I was hurting, man. And still, there's no there's no recognition of like, hey, uh, we need to do something for these guys. We just took them and subjected them to just profuse trauma and human suffering, and we're supposed to be these empathetic and compassionate operators, and we're just subjecting them to just human suffering at a fucking magnitude that like the human brain, the human soul can't actually comprehend um and we don't give them fucking tools to to heal we don't give them tools to identify man like we we you, did you do your, did you do your fucking did you do your cbt did you take that test man, you're good bro you know pat on the shoulder oh sweet soldier up you're deploying and you know in six weeks going back there so for me when i was when i was an active pj i never and i fucking say this i never was given or shown appropriate tools on how to heal, how to identify and how to move on. Nor did I feel that the, the career field offered a safe space to be vulnerable and to share those things, man. The second I go and I, I, I tell somebody that I'm having a difficult time, well, what the fuck, what's your problem, pussy? You know, now I'll take you off flight status, I can't trust you. I'm, I'm very thankful that the, the mentality amongst the entire special operations community has shifted. At the time, it was not that. So, so for me personally, as it relates to how did I overcome these traumas and like how did I move beyond it, this was something that I had to, just like I had to attach a higher purpose to becoming a pararescue man, I had to attach a higher purpose to softening my inner armor and healing. And for me, that was my kids. And I, I recognized that, you know, I didn't want to be the guy who allowed all these experiences and all these missions to like impact the experience of life and, and, and compassion and, and connection that I wanted to have with my kids. You know, and I already felt that enough had been taken from them with me being gone so often. So my last assignment, I mean, I, I, I had the ocean. I always, I always had the water. You know, if I was stationed in the stateside, I would always make a point to go get in the water, you know, go out and go take surf trips or, or whatever. And my, you know, my last, uh, my last duty assignment, I was in, I was in Okinawa and uh, I'm thankful for that, man. That was some of my darkest times. And like, I, I had the ability to, even though I was still in that environment, I was still an active PJ. I still had this like place where I could go that was safe and it was always safe. And like, I would go out and I would go kiteboarding. I would go free diving. I would go out and I'd surf and I would just be in that energy. And even if everything didn't make sense when I went into the water, when I left the water, it made sense at least for just like a minute or two. And maybe I would sleep a little bit, you know, I, I would, I would fall asleep with more ease or maybe I'd sleep a few minutes longer. And it was those moments that like, they kept calling me back and I was like, man, there's, there's fucking something there. So when I got out, um, when I left active duty, I, I moved to Hawaii. Um, I had, a, uh, I had a, a, a couple bros who were killed in a helicopter crash, Pedro 66, on June 9th, 2010. Mike Flores was, uh, was the PJ team leader on that mission. And uh, his, he left behind his widow, Marisa, and uh, his two kids, Mikey and Ellie. And uh, Marisa was originally from Hawaii, and she moved to, uh, she got a humanitarian assignment. She was still active duty, and she got a humanitarian to, um, to Hickam. And I left active duty, and I was like, man, I need to go be, need to go by, be my, by Marisa. You know, Mike and I kind of had that unspoken conversation that, you know, in the event something happens, like, yeah. fucking look after it. <clears throat> so I moved to Hawaii, and uh, I just... When I was in when I was in high school, for some reason I I grabbed the book on yoga. You know, and this is like you know twelve years 
earlier and I remember reading this book and I'm just kind of intrigued with this whole concept of like Eastern philosophy and, you know, um, body and breath and mind control, you know, it was mysticism at that point, but it still intrigued me at that, at that young age. And, uh, for some reason, I don't know if I had a dream or if I was just felt compelled. I was like, man, I need to, uh, I need to give this like yoga shit a try. You know, and I was, I was living like right on, I lived in a shitty termite infested shack right on the beach in Hawaii. Man, it was amazing, <laughs> but it was right down the road from Marisa. And, um, I got to kind of be, be home and present, like with my kids and, um, so your kids were with you at this point. They were with me at this point. I was, I was out, man. I was, I was, uh, I was still married and, um, my, uh, we, we lived at this, uh, you know, in this house and I took this time, this like post, you know, 13 year military career to kind of like to heal and to do it through learning and understanding and studying yoga, being in the ocean, being in that energy, you know, practicing these, these, uh, you know, these, these breath work and meditation. And like, this is kind of like pre YouTube. This is kind of pre the, you know, Instagram and the abundance of like all these guiding resources. And I just sort of like, I went to the library and I got books and I read and I interpreted them as, as it made sense to me. Right. As like, how can I take these lessons that I have, have had as a PJ and in combat and how can I explore this concept of yoga and how can I, you know, rely on this like maternal healing energy of the ocean? How can I combine all of them and actually find a healing practice? And, uh, you know, over the course of 11 months, man, that was, um, that, that was it, bro. That was the, the focus. Good. And then, so just kind of committing myself to this environment of, of, of healing. And it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily like, you know, I, I did these things and I was like, fuck yeah, I'm ready to go. But it was like these little subtle things of like, you know, maybe, maybe I, I, I drank less that night. Maybe I, um, you know, I, I only took like <laughs> four out of van instead of eight, you know, or whatever. And like, I started to notice these little like returns to a normalcy that I really couldn't remember in, in recent times, but I like the way that it felt. I like the way my body felt. I like the way that, you know, I started to, you know, explore this concept of, of how we store trauma in our body and what, and I was by no means, you know, a master at this shit, but it was, it was, it was an organic, like self reflection of, of discovery. And, you know, my interpretation of, of yoga and my interpretation of, of these practices is a lot different than the shit you see on like fucking Instagram with like, you know, naked white girl, just, ah, I'm so fucking wrong. Uh, give me, you know, let me get more fucking lights. Like, fuck that, man. It was like, for me, it was this like raw, deeply personal practice where yeah. I've, 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 I've made the comparison before, you know, that, you know, that scene in the Shawshank redemption where, uh, he's like chipping away at his yeah. cell and he walks out into the prison yard and he like Drops empties his pockets. Yeah. For me, it was like, I would, I would get up in the morning in Hawaii, you know, and I would, it was quiet and I would practice yoga and I would like move my body and I would identify like different parts where like, fuck, if I do this, it reminds me of that. And I would like force myself to like sit through that discomfort. And then I would reward myself, man. I'd get up and I'd go in the ocean, you know, I'd go for a kite, I'd go for a, you know, a swim or a paddle or some shit. And I would just be in that environment. And for me, it was like dumping all of my, my, my prison cell into the prison yard. And that's sort of, you know, I did this every day for like 11 months and I noticed an, I noticed an improvement, man. I stopped drinking. Um, and you know, this is a really, this is being guided from books and, 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 and interpretation and like what the, uh, what the concept of yoga, which is so fucking skewed in this modern era of what it meant for me and how I could apply this practice to, to healing and, you know, and, and still maintain this like this deep maternal energetic energetic connection with the ocean that like reminded me that like everything was safe and everything was okay. But man, that was uh, that was a pretty heavy experience. And then you know recognizing it. So I think the the real turning point for me in uh, in life was uh, I I was I signed up to do this paddleboard race from the island of Molokai to the island of Oahu, and it's like a typically it's a thirty two mile. Um, stand up paddle and prone paddle board race. Yeah. 
Um, and it's usually supposed to be like a downwinder, like the wind blows at your back and you kind of like surf these different bumps to, you know, all the way to Oahu. Yeah. You know, it's a feat, man. You know, it's, it's usually like a, it's, you know, like the most difficult paddleboard race in the world. And uh, I'd signed up to do it and I was going to do it in honor of, of Pedro 66 and, and for Mike. And there was this, um, <laughs> there was this tropical storm, tropical storm Flossie that, had shifted the winds and they, it, it turned it from a downwinder to a crosswinder. So oh, it was blowing me to like fucking Tahiti <laughs> and, uh, half the pro field that all the pro riders, they like, they'd pulled out cause they're like, Oh, I'm not going to get good times. And it was like the worst conditions, like in the history of this race. And, uh, I'm, I'm in the middle of this, it's called the Kaibi channel, the channel of bones. And like, um, it's like this like super treacherous body of water and like <clears throat> 5,000 feet below me is, you know, countless, you know, ships and souls that, you know, have, have kind of passed in these, in these treacherous waters. And I'm just, I'm exhausted, man. I, I already been paddling for like four hours and the sun's just beating down on me and I can't, I can barely even see Oahu. And I was like, man, this is fucking like, this is brutal. You know, I'd never quit in my life. And I was like, man, I don't, I don't know if I can make this. And so I like sit down on my board for a second and I'm kind of, I'm like trying to like go through my, my mental calculus of like, how do I find the tenacity and like, what's that higher purpose that I can, that I can chip into. And, um, I, I had this realization that like, you know, if I wasn't, if I wasn't carrying around so much unnecessary bullshit, I'd have so much more space in my life for like other things. I'd have the energy to like get through this. And I would, you know, if I wasn't carrying this fucking, you know, these memories and these, these traumas and this, like, you know, this, this fucking woe is me mentality. And like, I started to like, choose to like really like live and let these experiences serve as something greater than myself and like stop letting them define me but letting them like become my superpower that like you know what i i could uh, shit would change so at that moment i was like fuck it yeah it stays here like this is it like my, my, my bullshit stays here it's gonna sink to the bottom of this fucking channel awesome. paddled across bro it was fucking hard but i paddled like the rest of the way man and i i, I remember uh, the race had an eight hour cutoff if you weren't out of the water in eight hours the escort boat comes to get you and uh man i, I round this buoy like right at eight hours and i can see the finish i was the last the last dude they let finish before they pulled everybody else out of the water and uh, the conditions were so bad that year that like all the pros, you know, who had finished, you know, a lot sooner than that were like all kind of like everybody like waited on the beach for everybody to finish. Yeah. And uh, I finished and I got to the beach and it was like my kids were there. And like the first thing I said was like, can I can I stop paddling now? Like I have to stop paddling. And man, that was uh, I left a lot of shit in that channel. I left a lot of uh, left a lot of those those hardened edges. I left a lot of that that internal armor in the middle of that channel. And then um, the next day. I made this, I made this like this, I said it out loud. I was like, I was like, man, I think I'm, uh, I think I'm ready to go back to work. Like I'm ready to like move on to the next chapter. And uh, fuck dude, as soon as I said that, like the next day I get, I'm, I get headhunted by this, uh, this company to go, um, to go do remote medical uh, support and, you know, basically be like a, a medic kiteboarding surf instructor. And, uh, so yeah, <laughs> right so, your wheelhouse, so, so it was pretty cool. Yeah, man. So, uh, you know, did that for, for a number of years and, you know, I've transitioned into something different now, but, um, the, the focus for me has been, how do I then share these, these, this story of, of healing and this journey of healing with people who, you know, are aware of these modalities, but maybe don't know how to apply them to their daily life. You know, just like you and, you know, the story of your podcast with, you know, healing from, you know, you know, from your surgeries and from your injuries. It's like, you want to share this experience, not because you want to gain anything from it, but just because you want to show somebody that they're like, there is an alternative because if there's one thing that we all desire. It's to be like understood. And we desire that, like that deeper connection with people. So it's like, you know, if, if somebody that, that you, if you're reaching somebody who's struggling with, you know, with uh, the anxiety of, of, you know, a life changing surgical event or, you know, an addiction or, you know, if we're dealing with somebody who has PTS, like what we all, what we all seek is that, that credibility and that connection. So it's through sharing these stories and sharing these practices and these, you know, these, uh, these, these, these concept of concepts of, of hope and, and healing that like we can all kind of grow together and, you know, allow these traumas to turn us into, uh, you know, our own versions of superheroes. So definitely, man, I, uh, <clears throat> I was always bummed in the, uh, in the military because, you didn't have 
or not bummed while I was in. I was bummed after I got out. I was like, man, if I would have known some of the things that I know now while I was in, how much better off would I have been? And I remember I, I got myself into some uh, into some trouble. You know, I was I had too much time on my hands, and I was uh, doing steroids, and you know, you know, just carrying on. I wasn't really I wasn't hurting anybody. I was just you know wanted to work out a lot, and I was juicing. You know, it is what it is. <laughs> Come on, man. Um, what? Yeah. So I got I got popped for that, and I was looking at you know being in some serious trouble. You know, it's definitely frowned upon within definitely within the Air Force. I don't know what the other branches are like, but the Air Force is definitely frowned upon. <clears throat> Um, and at that time I was just in a dark place cause I didn't know what the future held for me. I was like, Oh shit, dude, I'm who knows what's going to happen. You know, I'm going to Leavenworth. Like what's up with this? <laughs> and, uh, um, fucking work out, man. Yeah. yeah. So I found this book of the art of happiness by the Dalai Lama Yeah. and it like changed my life. Nice. It like changed like at my whole perspective, like on life. And so when I got out, it took me a while to where to get where I am today. But like, that's what I, I feel like my passion is to really share like with the veteran community, some of the things that they're missing while they're in. Like you were saying that, you know, it's like, Hey dude, like, uh, you good. You ready to go on another mission? You good. And no one's like willing to be vulnerable. And there is a couple people that, you know, I've had in my life that I know they've experienced traumatic things. And my wife will ask me, Oh, Hey, why don't you hang out with so-and-so, you know, whatever. And I'm like, I can't connect with that person. Yeah. And she's like, well, why? And I was like, cause I know that they've experienced like traumatic experience and they're not willing to even talk about it. Yeah. They can't even like relate. They can't be vulnerable enough with me to like share like their hurt and their pain. So for me, it's like, I feel like it's a, it's a fake relationship. It's Definitely. not, it's not real. Yeah. Um, and I'm not trying to be a judgy asshole. It's just like, I know what pain is. I know what trauma is because I've experienced it. Right. And the, the people that I can share that with openly are the ones that I feel completely connected with and close with. And in the veteran community, especially, I really hope that it's shifting because there was a lot of that. There was a lot of that whole, you know, oh, you can just suck it up. Stop being a pussy. And, uh. And it, dude, it, it kills people, man. Man, it absolutely does, you know. And if there's one thing, if there's one thing that I learned, I, I understand what you're saying, and I absolutely, you know, I've, I've been in similar experiences. But if there's one thing that I've learned is that we, every single human being, carries some form of trauma. You know, even though if we don't, even if we're not ready to talk about it, even though if we're not ready to face it or confront it, like we all have trauma to carry. And I think it's on, it's on those of us that, you know, I, I like to to share this um there was this old pj became a combat rescue officer his name's kevin kirby and one lesson that kevin kirby said he said pjs do what they do because they give a fuck and he's like why do we do this and he's like we just need we need more people who give a fuck who are going to be who are going to like be patient and be an example for those people who who need to to identify and heal from their traumas but you know, maybe they're not ready, man. And maybe you can't connect with them now, but give a fuck and be patient. And that's what, you know, if people, you know, if people, you, you can't, we can't turn our back on, on each other just because somebody's not ready to, to, you know, to share. If somebody's not ready to, to do that work for themselves, man, it's a scary place. Yeah. But the more that we can keep sharing those stories and keep being an example of, of, of hope and, and healing, man, like I, I, the community, the veteran community as a whole is going to, it's going to react and it's going to respond. It already is. I've seen such a massive shift, like in the last five years, that is just a beautiful thing to witness. And, you know, just like, uh, just like anything of good, man, humans have the capacity to fuck it up pretty good, you know, and you have some people that they, they come into it for the wrong reasons, but I think collectively we're doing, we're doing a, a good job. Is it 15 years too late? You know? Yeah. Have we lost entirely too many people to suicide and to, to um, you know, destructive life choices, fucking absolutely. But do we give up? No, we keep going, man. We keep pressing ahead. We keep sharing. We keep we keep reaching out to people. We keep calling. We keep sharing our own vulnerability because in being vulnerable with others, we're making it safe for them too. And you know, and that's 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 part of my mission. I know that's part of your mission. And um, fucking self righteousness aside, man, just like pick up the fucking phone, call somebody, like what like it's okay to hurt man you know what it's even more okay to fucking feel better you know it's yeah. it's more okay to heal and to to get beyond this shit and get back to living your life and to not you know hiding from it with alcohol or drugs or destructive behaviors and to like truly get out there and like restructure your your way of thinking around these experiences and these and you know these these uh these traumatic events inside yeah and i think that part of the like for me was like letting people know that like 
it's okay not to be okay. Yeah. You know what I mean, and like I, I was struggling with it myself. I was telling my buddy that I, uh, you know, I, I went down the road of opiate addiction. I went down the road of like every bit and every benzo you could think of. I've probably taken it and copious amounts of it. Yeah. And when I quit all of it, it was a traumatic experience, like trying to get off all of it. But then I got to a point in my life recently where my anxiety and like panic attacks were like just like flaring up. And so I, I go to the self discovery. Okay, why is this happening? Like, what's going on? Like, what am I not addressing? Like, what's what's happening? But it was getting to the point where like I couldn't function. Like I was like I can't function, and so I took like an anti anxiety pill to like calm my like central nervous system to like get me to be able to think straight. Yeah. And dude, I kicked myself. I, I kicked my ass for it. I, I was like beating myself up over it. Like I can't believe I took another anti anxiety pill. Oh my god, it's the end of the world. Yeah. And uh, a, a good buddy of mine was like, you know what, man, stop being such an asshole to yourself. <laughs> yeah. you know, at the end of the day, man, it's okay not to be okay. For sure. And it, there's nothing wrong with trying to help people while you're helping yourself. Absolutely. You know, like, well, I'm a work in progress. I'm not perfect. You know, I'm human. You know? Absolutely. But it's through uh, that, it's through sharing that journey too, that, you know, some of the most, the most healing can take place. Yeah. I, I, I don't think anybody has all their shit figured out. You know, no, <laughs> nobody gets out of this experience alive and nobody has just been like, man, that fucking guy's got it all figured out. Like that guy, you know I mean? He may present on the, on the, on his external, but man, we all have bullshit. You know, we, none of us come with instruction manuals and we're just like these organic fucking containers of a lifetime full of, you know, experience and traumas and memories and hopes and dreams. And nobody's got this shit fucking figured out. So absolutely, man, take it, Go with the fucking ride. Go with the flow. Have your good days. Have your bad days. But have those practices in place where you can, you can, you can go to like when it's when the darkness starts to come or when it starts to creep in. Like have those outlets. Have those, you know. For me, it's for me, it's the ocean or you know, kiteboarding or surfing or you know, just being in that energy or it's yoga. But man, I have fucking dark days too, man. You know, like I have days where just I wish I could just like get that sensation of you know just that 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 numbing comfort of. Jack Daniels. I don't drink, you know, I haven't drank in like five years and right. um, it's like, but those, those are just band-aids. Those are band-aids. Totally. And it's like, if we, we, I, I have, and you have the rest of your life to, to figure this shit out. So, yeah. you know, keep trying, man, keep fucking one foot in front of the other. And yeah, that was the other thing too, is I quit like uh, drinking over like a, a year and a half ago or whatever. Nice. And, Congrats. Uh, thanks brother. And that was kind of a, uh, that was the other issue is that like, I just kind of like cut it out of my life completely. So I was like, oh shit, like I don't have a numbing agent to like kind of get me through those like darker days. I was like, dude, how do I cope with this? How do I get through it? And I still had that old school mentality of like, no, oh, be a man, stop being a pussy. Mindset is everything and like this and that. And it's like, there is a part of me that that's definitely ingrained in who I am. You know, like mm -hmm. I overcome things just by with pure mindset and willpower grit and, and willpower yeah. and all that other good stuff. So, but with that comes the shame of like when I have a bad day or when I have a dark day or whatever. And it's like, should I succumb to something or whatever? It's like, don't get back in the saddle, man. Yeah. You know? And that's kind of the message I want to share with people. Like it's okay to not be perfect. Absolutely. Um, Cause with that, I think for me at least like a lot of shame was associated with that yeah. and, and fuck that dude. Like yeah. I don't want to live in shame. Definitely. I think we're sort of doing ourselves a disservice too, with, especially with the, um, you know, I, I know both you and I have social media platforms and we share, we just share glimpses of our, of our journeys. Absolutely. And, you know, we have at our disposal, we have the opportunity to see, you know, moments in time of somebody else's story. We have the opportunity to look at somebody who has this like picture of them on a beach in Tulum in a fucking bathing suit. And they're just like, Oh, they're so enlightened and so blissful. <laughs> and it's like, it's like, so I think for a lot of us, social media is actually creating more anxieties than others because we're comparing ourselves to these other people out there. It's like, I've, I, I've had people reach out to me and they're like, dude, you have your fucking shit figured out, man. Like, how do I, how do I get to this level of peace? And it's like, bro, it's like, man, this is a, this is a process. You see, yeah. you see a glimpse of what it is that like, of, that I'm, that I'm choosing to share with you. And I wish that you could come into my day to day life and see that the, 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 the work that I put in, you know, on my own, like, it's not just like, uh, Matt can, you know, touch his toes and do handstands and fucking take deep breaths and, you know, all this shit. It's like, man, no, there's a process to it. There's a conscious choice every single day to put work in on myself and to, you know, to, to learn and to reflect and grow because, man, life does not stop. You know, just because I'm not in combat anymore doesn't mean that I don't have my own, like, you know, we don't have fucking life happen to us at a constant moment. But if we have these practices and we can share them on these, on these social media outlets, but we can also leverage the reality of it too. I think that's, we need more of that. 
We yeah. need we need less of just like like oh man I'm you know I've I've fucking made it big I'm this veteran entrepreneur or you know I I've done this or this or that and it's like people we don't we, the idea is like not to discourage people it's to empower people and to motivate them and I feel that um, you know those social media um, uh, outlets are a double edged sword and it, it's uh, we have to use these these tools responsibly for people you know it's yeah. you know i think we need we need more fucking 22 push-ups a day bullshit fuck off man like <laughs> no man we need more people sharing more people telling stories more people like you know creating communities where we are um you know we may not know each other and we we may have never met but you can identify with something that i'm sharing and, and vice versa and then we and we all get through this experience you know collectively there's no end goal there's no like oh fuck you're healed now, man. Go on, live yourself. You know, it's like there's there's no end goal. It's like how can we create these practices and these these relationships and these communities where it's just a, a way of life that you know healing and growth and you know and 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 living become become our our benchmarks. Yeah, for sure. I think for uh, for me, you, you said something just now that uh, made me think like when uh, that life doesn't stop for anything, it just keeps going. You know, and like I remember when. I experienced my first like major loss when I lost like my grandmother. It was like, I felt like I couldn't breathe. It was like, dude, I, I don't even have time to like, how do I process this? Dude, I don't even know how to get over it, you know? Because like life doesn't stop. Like my kids still need me, things, uh, my, my job still needs me. I still have things to do. And like, I didn't have any time to really like catch my breath. That's what it felt like. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of people experience that, you know? And I think for me, like I'm going on this, uh, this men's retreat tomorrow and there's no cell service. There's no like anything. So it's going to be great to have like four days of just checking out for a minute, you know, like just checking out completely, no social media. And I was sharing this with somebody the other day with the social media, like it's almost becomes like a responsibility. You know, it's like you put things out, you know, and you can't help yourself, but you're looking at what other people are doing. And there's been plenty of times where I've looked at someone on social media and I've thought the same thing, like, wow, they have their shit together. And then I've met them in person. I'm like, Dude, you're a pretentious asshole. Like, I want nothing to do with you. you know? Yeah, or you see somebody like uh, Joe Rogan's podcast, and you're just like, fuck, you become, like, discouraged by it because right. it's like, well, I really want to be this Joe Rogan thing. Yeah, totally. Uh, you, brought so, up a, you brought up a... I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. so I, I'm glad that I'm going to get that four days of just, like, kind of decompressing and being like, all right, cool, like a little detox, if you will. Yeah, you, um, you, you sort of... You hit on a concept that I like to talk about a lot with... We are never, never taught in the military how to be selfish. You know, one of, especially for, for you and I in the Air Force, one of our core values is service before self. All the different branches have that same similar concept where the idea of service unto others is always greater than service to yourself. And while I think that imparts a tremendous, you know, that's what makes our, our militaries like the greatest in the world because, you know, we, we are committed to the service. I think it also does a disservice to, to men and women when they get out and they don't understand the concept of self-care. And they don't know how to take that time for themselves. It's always like, give, 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 give. Um, you know, the this needs to be taken care of. And you do this, and you do that. But it's like, what's you know, what's what's Josh doing, man? When's he uh, when's he filling his cup back up again? And until we we learn to find acceptance and peace with the idea that like it's it's not only okay to take time for it's fucking imperative that you find time and take it for yourself, even if it's something, you know. I know this is huge, man. I, I love all my fucking bros and who've gotten out and are all into firearms and shit. That's, that's really cool. If like, that's your outlet, man. But like, there's so many outlets out there that exist that are, that are completely separate of anything that you've experienced in the military. And that's, you know, with, you know, our foundation is like, we really want to expose people to the, the concept of like ocean therapy. It may not be for everybody, but for somebody it's, it could be a life changing experience to like take this time for yourself. It's for no other it is no for no other purpose than pure recreation and fun. Like I'm not taking these dudes out surfing and kiteboarding because, like, it's gonna make them better at like doing their taxes and shit. It's like no, I'm taking this because <laughs> it is fucking fun right. and it is healing and yeah. it is like there are greater lessons you know that I share in these practices. But like taking the time for yourself, you know, is is the most important and yeah. important element of continued healing and growth. What would you say for somebody who's uh you know, on the couch in a funk, can't seem to shake it. They're, they're bogged down with maybe some traumatic experience they've experienced and 
they don't know what to do. They don't know where to turn. How, how did you start and how would you recommend somebody else starting to like get to that place where you need to start healing? Well, you know, like I said earlier, man, my motivation was something greater than myself. I wanted to do this. I wanted to do it for my kids. I didn't want to be, you know, this broken, deadbeat, you know, absent, emotionally absent father. I wanted to be present. I wanted to be alive. I wanted to be living and, and sharing. So for people who, who are struggling, I, I think a lot of it is there, you know, and this is something that's not just that relates to healing, but we, we lose our identity and our sense of purpose when we get out of the military. Um, that's something that we all struggle with, regardless if you're a PJ, if you're a cook, if you're a fucking supply guy, it doesn't matter. It's when you leave the military, you lose your, although it's fragmented and, and shitty at times, you also, you lose your support structure. You lose the camaraderie, even if, you know, you find yourself like, man, I used to fucking hate these commander's calls. You find yourself craving, craving that, or, you know, there's all sorts of things that, that contribute to this, this mental and emotional decline when we leave active service. But it's, we, when we, we are add, adding trauma on top of that, it becomes even more difficult for men and women. So my first like guiding point is like, why do you want to heal? And it can be something as simple as like, man, I just want to fucking feel better. Like I want to, you know, I want to, I want to experience the sensation of living again. I want to be excited for something. I want to be optimistic. I want to have something to look forward to. And it's like, there needs to be this, like, you need to take that hard look at yourself and be like, what, what am I doing this for? Am I doing it because, you know, I'm in, I want to be like this person on social media or this fucking person has it all figured out. Like, what is your motivation? What is your why? And once you once you identify the why, the rest just comes, man. And you know, you just you just commit to the process of, of healing and commit to the process of growing. Um, you know, and you seek out. There's so many people out there who give a fuck. And I know at the times, you know, when you're at your darkest and your lowest, and you're sitting on the couch, or you know, you're you're drinking and you're in that darkness, man. It, it may seem like there help is you know a million miles away and it will never come but there are people who give a fuck and this is something that through these these conversations and these podcasts and these you know these different different people and different organizations it's like we're reaching more and more people and more people are like having these these support systems to lean in on but man if if you're just like there's help out there man there's there's people who give a fuck and who are working tirelessly behind the scenes and around the clock to you know, to, to be there for you, you know, you just gotta, you know, you have to, you have to show up and just fucking ask for help, man. So totally. yeah. what about for the active guys? I mean, cause obviously we need guys like you that are going to go out there and, and be a, a nightmare for bad guys. So, and you know, to be the, you know, that others may live, you know, go and save lives. For so sure. for those guys, what would you tell them as far as like how to balance being a father if they have kids or a husband if they have a wife and still being an operator and being available to their team well thankfully like i said man this stuff's starting to permeate active culture as well as the veteran community as well like we are starting to make progress and the dod is starting to teach you know mindfulness practices and these things are becoming a lot more mainstream kind of the, that double-edged sword of social media is that not only are we being exposed to you know potentially you know harmful content we're also being exposed to really fucking powerful content and beneficial stuff and more and more people more and more of the teams and the different units these guys are, are starting to prioritize and this shit's becoming more mainstream being fucking con committed to healing and growth is becoming okay and it's becoming something that is permeated you know the special forces uh special operations communities the veteran communities and it's like and we we we, we have momentum now we have that traction um, so finding balance is, is, it's the same concept. It's like, you have to identify your why and you have to learn how to, to do these practices, you know? Um, and there, there are people out there who are, you know, who are, who are sharing these, you know, the dev is bringing in, I think fucking Wim Hof just went there, you know, up to, to damn next. So he's up there with a sexy Dutch accent. It's oh, oh, oh. He's doing all that cool <laughs> shit, but it's fucking cool. It's right. I mean, it's, yeah. it's his jam and it's, and it's like, it's becoming, it's becoming okay. And there is a massive paradigm shift. Um, so it's, it's a, it's a really great thing to see. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Um, if you could do it all over again, 
would you do it the same way as far as like would you go to the air force would you be, <laughs> would you be a pj or would you do i mean looking back on it would Man, you do it differently yeah i would fucking do it differently um i don't know what though i i never want to live in a position of regret i just you know, I growing up how I did and living overseas, you know, I never had a college scholarship opportunities. I didn't know about any of these things. I didn't know about the guard and reserve. Um, so, I mean, no, dude, I, would, I wouldn't have done it differently. Um, just I'm, I'm thankful for, for what happened and, and how life turned out and how these different experiences turned out. And I mean, yes, I would have liked different things along the way, but man, I'm still alive, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm still kicking, I'm still cruising and, uh, you know, I have the rest of my life to, to, to shift and to go back to, you know, whatever it was that I was seeking in those earlier days and to, to find it. So, uh, there, thankfully there's a lot more information now and guys and, and, and girls are joining, you know, the military with, um, with far more knowledge and I'm sure you and I went into it with, Totally. so I'm um, thankful for that. Would you be okay with your kids joining the military, knowing what you know? Yeah, absolutely. It's funny because my, I'm like trying to convince my, uh, I'm trying to convince both of my kids to go be Coast Guard rescue swimmers. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, kind of the. I mean, it's it's like they both have that they both have that affinity and the love for the water that I do, and they both have so much talent. And it's like, okay, you know, can we? How can we? You know how focus on this this desire? But I mean, if they came back and they wanted to be you know seals or PJs or fucking whatever they want to do, man, support them. Um, but definitely share with them the, the lessons that I had and, and hope that they can make their own mistakes and not repeat mine. Yeah, totally. Yeah. If you had um, one person or one book that inspired you the most your entire life, who would that person be and what would that book be and why? Fuck, man. Uh, you're going to have to edit the long pause out of this one. Um, man, I tell you, I'm... I draw inspiration from literally every, and we all do. We all draw inspiration from everything we see, every person we meet. And it, it may not necessarily be this like, fuck man, I want to, I want to be what this person has. Maybe it's, man, I never want to be like you or so I, I don't know that I can actually answer that question. I, I would tell you that you should learn some practices of reflection and practices of, of like presence so that you can in all of your interactions with people and all of the books and all of the movies and all the things that you watch, if you can identify and relate to each character, each individual person, each individual personality, true or, you know, or, 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 um, or nonfiction, it's like, what can you take away from that person? How can you make these connections have more, more value and more meaning? And like, what can I, like, for example, meeting you today, I'm, I'm tremendously inspired by your podcast. I'm, I think it's an, That's it's like seeing, that. seeing your setup and like what you have going on and you're just like your tenacity and you're showing up and you're doing the work for me. It's like, fuck man, this is something I've, I've taken away from Josh today. It's like, I'm, I'm inspired by you. And cool. it's like, how do we do that in, in day-to-day -day life? You know, I could be like, man, fuck, I will never wear a fucking tie dye, but you know, it's, <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, how do we, how do we, how do we bring that mindfulness? And that's truly what mindfulness is. It's, it's being it's being present with these experiences and being present in these moments. Um, so there you go. There's a book by Thich Nhat Hanh called The Miracle of Mindfulness. It's real thin. It's real, it's real fucking simple. But uh, within that book, it's, um, it's, it's sort of maybe prize open the door a little bit to peek in and what to the concept of mindfulness is. And it's up to you to kick that motherfucker open and go in full, full steam and become like, yeah, I'm fucking. That's so, good shit. So, so that's that's uh, that's that's my, my. That's why I love that question because like it's you have like I go back and listen to all these podcasts right and I get to see like it's like an Oprah's book club you know like you, <laughs> there's all these books that like some of them I've heard of them and some of them I fuck I have no clue what they are you know I know who Tic Tac Han is I'm probably butchering his name but um, I've read a couple of his books but not that one so it's definitely one I'm gonna check out for sure. Yeah, that's a good one. Miracle Mindfulness is good. <laughs> um, fuck man, it, there's some incredible books. There's a book called Deep. Um, it, it's, uh, it's about free diving and also about, about whales. And there's surprisingly a lot of, um, a lot of insight and a lot of kind of, you know, not so much like esoteric concepts, but different, different ideas. You know, it's a, it's a book I've read recently that I really enjoyed. Um, dude, I just, I love it all, man. I love learning and like experiencing this, this concept of living and, you know, truly taking something from everybody I encounter, whether it's good or or bad, it still it still serves as a different example and a different filter with which how to live my life, and um, 
Yeah, man. So that's that's probably the, my direction. Yeah, my uh, <clears throat> my wife tells me that, uh, or she's she's doing this class, uh, energy alchemy, um, healing and stuff. And one of the things they told her was that we all have soul agreements with everybody in the universe, right? So like when you have like this good experience with somebody, it's like you had a soul agreement with that person that at some point in time, your souls were going to connect and you were going to learn something from that person. It was going to be good. It was going to be bad. It was going to be whatever. And even when it is a bad experience, like you had that agreement with that person long time ago and then they came down here and you came down here, you connected. It may have been a terrible experience in that you know, time frame for you, but you learned something from it. For like, sure. And you had that agreement a long time ago. I'm like, wow, that's a fucking interesting concept. <laughs> <laughs> like, you can, excuse me, you can definitely go deep with that one. But anyway, um, the other question I wanted to ask you is if you had one lesson that you could teach either a younger Matt or just a younger person coming up in the world, like the biggest lesson that you learned that you could save someone else the heartache of going through maybe a hard experience, um, what would that lesson be that you'd want to share with somebody and why? Do what makes you happy. Because if you're not if you're not doing what makes you happy and if you're not following your dreams and and like at least putting forth some work into it, man, you become resentful and cynical and the, it's your your desire to to continue just atrophies. So do feed the parts of you that need something like individual. Like for me, I I know what I need to do to make myself happy, and I need to do though. I need to prioritize that, you know. And it's like, how can I? put forth as much energy to like making myself happy because when I'm happier I have a fuller cup and I can give to other people and you know it's it's how can I identify happiness um in in everything that I do so it's it's it sounds simple but it's it's truly like for me it's a guiding principle every single day it's like what can I do today to 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 bring happiness to myself so that I can bring happiness to others right so and it's i mean it's kind of cheesy and it's not like these like profound words of wisdom but it's like man just do what makes you happy because in the end it's like as far as i know we only get to live one time and like i want to live and truly like live the shit out of this life so and for me it's you know it's seeking happiness and happiness comes in all sorts of forms you know it comes in you know, seeing my kids when they wake up in the morning it's you know fucking good cup of coffee it's a you know 50 foot wave it's it doesn't matter. It's like if I could, the more I can find happiness in my, in my day to day life, the more rich the experience of living becomes and the more like committed to, to like prolonging it and, you know, taking care of my health and my wellness and my family and like those around me, the more, you know, the more fuel I have to support those, those endeavors. Awesome, man. How do you think people find their purpose? <clears throat> like if someone's looking like, man, what's my purpose in life? You know, cause you see so many people that are just kind of floundering that they just go to work, they pay their bills and then they die, they retire and then they die. And it's like, I, I, I witnessed it when I was in corporate, you know, where I'd see these older guys that were in their sixties or whatever. And it's like, we're working in the elevator business. Like I, I'm pretty <laughs> positive. Like that's not something that you're passionate about, but it just pays you well. So you stay there. Of course. Um, how would you tell somebody like, yeah, this is how you, you could find your potentially find your passion. You know, I think, I think the, the, the question of like, if money was no issue, what would you be doing day to day? You know, enforcing that reflection. It's, it's so cliche and it's, you know, it's been asked, you know, infinite number of times, but there's so much, there's so much merit to that question of like, okay, because we are a, you know, resource driven or, you know, a consumer based society. And like, I have to have money. I have a mortgage to pay. I have this to pay. I have child support. I have a car payment. I have this. It's like, how do I, you know, if I don't have to worry about those external factors, what would I be doing with my time? I think that's what you would find purpose in. And for most people, you're going to find that it like, it, it mirrors your strengths and your talents and your gifts you know, for people who are, um, well, man, I, I have this like really successful podcast. Okay. Are you comfortable speaking? Are you good at conversations? Cause it chances are you are, if like, that's, what's interesting you. And this is something that's fueling you. Like it must be what you would be doing if you didn't have to worry about money, you know? So yeah. it's, it's so simple as is most of the you know concept of living. It's all simple shit, but it's like when we have, you know, a, you know, a backpack full of a thousand pounds of lightweight, simple shit, you know, that backpack still becomes kind of heavy. So it's like, if I have all these simple practices that I need to rely on day to day, like, you know, some shit gets pushed to the wayside and, you know, the experience of needing to go work a job that's depleting and unfulfilling 
because you have responsibilities in life. Like we all have that shit we all do. Um, but it's like, how can I find purpose? Like, what would I be doing if I didn't have to worry about any of this shit? What would I be doing? Is it for myself? Is it for others? Am I a servant? Am I, am I a comedian? Am I like, what the fuck? Like find it, man. And then feed it and then feed it a little bit every day. And then maybe a little bit more the next day. And if there's no, if there's no, this is something that I'm just gonna go off on a quick tangent. This, when we're in the military, if I want to be a pararescue man, if I want to be a Navy SEAL, if I want to be a Green Beret, the path to get there is laid out in front of me. Oh, fuck. Okay, I have to show up today. I have to run this fast. I have to do this many pull-ups. I have to do this in the pool. I have to do this, that. I have to pass this. The path is completely laid out, and then boom, berets on my head. If I want to go to the Olympics as an Olympic athlete, I train hard. I perform. I, I meet blah, blah, blah. Whatever the fuck. The path is laid out before me. If I have a dream that I want to be this or I want to be that, there is very rarely a clear cut path that is laid out in front of us. So it's up to us to like, how do we find that path? You know, and in some of the research I've done and some of my own work, it's like, you know, this, this concept of like reverse engineering, reverse timeline. Okay. If I want to be in this place in one year, what do I need to do today to be there at that point? If I want this to be successful, what do I need to do? You know, like what is my focus today so that tomorrow I can be that much closer to, you know, to my goal or, or to my dream. And, also the recognition that um, there is no end state. There is no end goal. And this is something of we struggle with as humans. Like, man, when I get out of the military, it's going to be, so, when I'm a PJ, it's going to be so much fucking better. When I get out of the military, it's going to be so much better. Oh, after this trip, it's going to be so much better. And it's like, we're sort of chasing the dragon on this concept of like, the grass is always going to be greener. And it's going to be greener. It's, you know, it's not. The fucking grass that you're standing on right now is the greenest, most fertile grass that you'll ever stand on again. So how do we find enjoyment and presence in our, our day-to-day, our day-to-day life. So I dig it, man. Yeah, man. <clears throat> Last question I want to ask you is if you, um, knew for certain that you were going to die tomorrow, like that was going to be the end you're expiring. How would you want to be remembered? Fuck is like the most sarcastic, funniest dude who like could <laughs> reference any song lyric of any time <laughs> and basically speak in movie quotes if you needed to. Uh, no, man, I just, I would want to be remembered as somebody who gave a fuck who, um, somebody who cared, you know, somebody who, uh, who, who did what he thought was best, you know, in, in any given time. And even though maybe it didn't resonate with you, you know, when I was, when I was still living, but I wanted to be seen as somebody that, showed up every fucking day and gave a hundred percent to, uh, to whatever the purpose, whatever the cause was. And, uh, and hopefully they had some pretty fucking good jokes too. So (laughs) how do people connect with you? What's the best way for people to get in touch with you? Uh, man, the, uh, the whole Instagram drug is probably the best one, man. I'm a special ohm parader, you know, a little play on words there with ohm being the the sacred sound. Yeah, man, that's probably the best way. Um, special ohm parader is, um, pretty direct on there. I'm pretty active on that. Um, but yeah, man, hit me up and uh, I try to engage with everybody. Um, I do have, you know, quite a lot of people reach out to me, but, um, I do make it a point to, to try and connect with everybody that, uh, that reaches out. So if you have any questions on, on fucking yoga, ocean therapy, healing, growth, fucking handstands, man, uh, hit me up for sure. You guys have like a, <clears throat> excuse me, that's my throat. Do you guys have a, um, like a foundation that you're working with veterans on the ocean therapy and we stuff do, like that? We do, man. Yeah, it's, it's, it's called, called it's called Beneath the Surface Foundation. So we're in our uh, we're in our early development stages, um, but uh, we have a tremendous Rolodex of support. And what this what the concept is is basically taking my journey of healing in Hawaii. You know, the yoga, the meditation, the um, the you know the mindfulness therapies, the breathing, and pairing that with uh, with the concept of ocean therapy. And, uh, and what that is, man, it's just a really sexy way of, you know, talking about surfing or kiteboarding or windsurfing or paddling. It's just using the ocean or, or, you know, the water, rivers, lakes, and these experiences on them to, to, uh, to attach a, a higher purpose to the concepts of, uh, you know, you're not just going out and, and surfing, but you're, you're recognizing that, you know, this wave that you're surfing was formed in chaos, you know, a thousand miles away. And it just has had time to sort itself out and it's had time to, become this beautiful source of energy that you're then becoming harmonious with and sharing it. And it's like, how can I apply this level of mindfulness and, and use surfing or, you know, kiteboarding as this, this practice of, of healing and also to have a lot of fucking fun in the process. And, um, so it's, it's, it's taking, taking these, these men and women, you know, into these environments and giving them a practice that they can, they can always rely on. You know, if I teach 
if I take you out and I teach you how to, how to surf, like that's, that's cool. Right. But you can't always surf. But if I teach you how to breathe and I teach you how to meditate and how to practice yoga and how to kind of like clear your mind with like five, you know, five minutes, that's a healing practice that you can carry on for the rest of your life. Um, but I want to reward that, that, that effort with something as beautiful as like ocean therapy and, you know, the practice of, of surfing and being in these environments and learning how to interact with nature and with humans and, kind of share the lessons with you that I'm still learning myself. You know, every day I go out in the water, it's, you know, it's a learning experience and I, I extrapolate a new lesson from it. And I just, how can I share with you the lessons I've already learned and I'm continuing to learn them. And it's through that foundation, through, uh, through beneath the surface foundation. And the idea is to just go like we're done with the superficial shit. We need to go, you know, it's a metaphor to go deeper within ourselves and also, you know, deeper into that, uh, those practices of healing and growth. So, yeah, so how do people connect with that foundation? What's the best way for them to support you? Uh, same thing, man. You can go on Instagram, Beneath the Surface Foundation, um, or it's Beneath the Surface Foundation dot org. Uh, go to the website. There's both links to it uh, on my um, on my Instagram of uh, Special Alm Parader too. So there's direct links to it. So yeah, man, that's the best way. And find us, reach out. Um, if you uh, if you know if it's something that interests you, like we um, it, we're doing a lot of stuff kind of off behind the scenes right now, kind of building. Um, building our proof of concept, building our, our, our empirical data of, that will support what it is that we're doing um, to truly release this thing as a uh, very powerful and, you know, and healing modality. Will you guys be teaming up with all, uh, at all with like any kind of um, shamanistic, you know, um, you know, plant medicine stuff? Is that going to be part of it or no? Potentially um, not something that we would do um, inherently within our program, but right. uh, we are in contact with other nonprofit foundations who do focus on, you know, some of the plant-based, you know, shamanistic healing modalities, and then also offering these tools as something to, to carry on after those experiences with the medicine, you know, yeah. especially through, um, you know, if you're, if you're taking this, this journey of, of healing and you use this incredibly powerful modality of, of a psychedelic, how can you then spend the rest of your life not needing to return to that state of medicine through the medicine, but how can you return there through your own practices? So that's sort of what we're working with externally. We don't plan on bringing, you know, some of those, we don't plan on bringing those therapies to, to our foundation because that's not, that's not our, you know, our, yeah. our, it's not our focus and that's not our subject matter expertise, but going to those foundations and, and sharing with, with them, you know, the practices that, that, uh, that we share. So, yeah. Good stuff, man. Well, Matt, I appreciate you so much for being willing to come on the podcast and share your story. And I know that like this, this podcast is definitely going to resonate with a lot of dudes and a lot of women out there that have, you know, whether they be veterans or just people that have experienced trauma in their life or whatever the case may be, um, that are looking for, you know, lo looking for healing, man. And yeah, I think man. this is going to definitely resonate with a lot of people. So I appreciate your willingness to come on and, and share your story and opening your home to me, man. It yeah. Thanks, thanks for coming out. I appreciate you having me on the show and for sharing your story and for, you know, creating this, uh, this, this safe space to, to be vulnerable and to share and to speak. And, you know, hopefully collectively we reach, you know, we reach more people than, um, you know, than ever before. So I appreciate you, man. All right, brother. Have a good one. Cheers, brother. Later. Thank you for listening to Getting Real with Josh Boyer. If you're loving the podcast, please leave a rating and subscribe. You can follow us on all social media platforms and YouTube at Getting Real underscore. You can also check us out at joshboyer.com.